Good snowy morning. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that couldn't make it because of the roads in your neighborhood, I welcome online. If you are online, please let us know by giving us a shout out in the comments there. We've got a lot of things coming up. It's a busy month. Can you believe that Friday is December already? <laughs> That's what you're like, no. I was really happy to see... <laughs> I was very happy and thrilled that the uh, shelter opened up the week before in that it was still warm out. So I was like, well, are they opening a little early? Nope, <laughs> not at all, just in time. So thank you, Lord, for getting that open just in time. To kick off uh, this month before we get all the way to the end of the month, this Wednesday night, we will not be having our traditional Bible study. We will do a time of prayer as we normally do, but we will be getting ready and decorating for Christmas. So if you would like to come and help us get the tree set up and get the poinsettias out and get everything set up and ready to go for Christmas, please join us on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And then very quickly in two days after that, it's December 1st. And this is this new Christmas tradition we've been talking about. And just as a reminder, we've got the analog <coughs> bookmarks for those that like analog. And we also have digital. So if you want to go out to our website and click on Christmas tradition, you can actually click the links that will take you to each day's reading throughout the course of that on Bible Gateway. And then what that does is it's going to get us through the entire book of Luke starting chapter one, and then on Christmas Eve, you will finish by reading the 24th chapter, the final chapter in the book, and you will have then read the entire account of Jesus's life. Now, this isn't in the slides, it's not in here, but if you want to <laughs> catch up with where we're at right now in The Chosen, because we're ending the final message of season three, Season four does not come out until next year, so we have to, God's making us learn patience. We have to wait until next year for that, but this morning we'll be uh, hearing the message that God has given to Pastor Mark on committing and submitting, and so we want to, if you haven't, go out to angel.com. It's the best place to get it for free. You don't have to worry about whether you've got a Prime or a Netflix subscription. You can catch it on the CW, but you got to watch it, in, you know, in the order that where they're currently at, but if you go out to angel.com, click on watch, click on the chosen, you can start with season one and binge watch the entire three seasons. And trust me, it's not hard to do Wednesday nights. We sit in here and it's like, can we see the next one? <coughs> nope. This time we can honestly say no because we will not be having that yet. But uh, following up on the very next day on Saturday. Saturday is a very busy day. So Saturday morning, men's breakfast, 9 a.m. Yes, Denny, there will be biscuits and gravy. <laughs> you might have to slide a little bit of a under the table to mark to make sure that happens. But we'll, oh, no. <laughs> we'll have our biscuits and gravy. We'll have the griddle set up and we'll be all ready to go. And the great thing about men's breakfast this month or this coming month, is that we don't have to tear down afterwards. Normally we have to tear down and set up for a movie night or something else. We're gonna leave everything up because at two o'clock we'll be serving a free meal. Uh, we have settled on Zio's as the menu. And so we want you to join us for that at two. And while we will be eating and talking and just getting along, then we will have to clean up after that. And we'll restage like this and we'll pull the movie up and at four o'clock we will watch Why the Nativity. And that will get us kicked off for our Advent series. Uh, so meal at two, movie at four, all of it free. So come and enjoy that with us. We'd love to have you. Um, if you want to invite someone and you need a way to do that, we have analog ways of doing that. We also have digital ways so you can share the posts that are on our Facebook page. So uh, please do that or on Instagram or on Twitter, or you can just share a link to our website. So uh, many different ways to get that shared out. That will 
suffices and then on Sunday we will start of course the sermon series but then we get you know a little bit of time we will have our Wednesday night Bible study at seven o'clock as normal starting with um, why the nativity and we will be going through that but we will also be getting ready to go Christmas caroling on the night and Denise has been gracious enough to help get us set up at some nursing homes and uh, we are looking forward to that but we are going to start here we like meals <laughs> we're going to start here and have some chili and some cornbread and everybody looked at me funny when i suggested cinnamon rolls because <laughs> nobody ever heard of chili and cinnamon rolls i've never actually tried it but my curiosity might get the best of me may may have to make a batch of cinnamon rolls to bring but we'll start at that and then we'll go out and we will uh, visit the different care centers and singing Christmas carols, which several of us all know too well that a lot of those folks do not get any visitors. And that breaks my heart. And that's why I'm filled with joy with the fact that we can go out and do this. So please join us for that on December 9th. Then Christmas Eve, um, you will be getting, a, we've gotten into these surveys as of late because we asked, you know, time for the movie and we've, we asked for folks to RSVP for the meal and the movie, which we are getting some of those back already. Uh, if you haven't gotten that, check your email, check your spam folder. If you didn't get the email, go to our Facebook page, click on the link and go out and let us know your name and how many you'll be bringing with you. Um, so we can do that, but we will be sending out another one because we're going to have church on Christmas Eve, our normal 10 a.m. service, but then we're going to have a candlelight service. Now, some folks like 7 o'clock, some folks like 8 o'clock, and then there's those of us that are really partial to that 11 o'clock service because there's just something special <coughs> about that. But instead of mark and i just making a random decision about it we are going to send out a survey and see uh, between those three times who would like what and uh, kind of give some power back to you all and let you have a say in what goes on so we'll be doing that on the 24th and then two weeks after that after men we'll be having men's breakfast on january 6th we seem to like to do that men's breakfast in the morning and then make the guys help us set up for the movie in the <laughs> evening so uh, but on january 6th we'll be showing a free movie bridge to terabithia it's a preteen's life gets turned upside down when he befriends the new girl in school and they imagine a whole new fantasy world to escape reality i'm sure this fantasy world that they create is very different than the ones that you and i all created when we were kids but it's a great movie. It's got some great Christian themes in it. We invite you to join us for that. Doors open at 5.30, movie at 6. As always, brownie bites, hot dogs, drinks, uh, popcorn. And the neat thing about popcorn is you just keep making it. <laughs> hot dogs, you yeah, know, it's until they run out. So join us for all of that on January 6th. For those of you that are watching online, be sure to click the link in the... Uh, comments there that uh, Pastor Mark will be putting in there with the worship set for today. If for some reason you have a trouble with that link, please message us and we will send that to you individually so that you have it. With that, you know, I'm sad to say we're ending season three today. For the call to worship this morning, we have two passages from Psalm 37, verses 5 and 6 and verses 23 and 24. Starting at verse 5, it says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Now, as I think about that passage, before we move on to the second half of this, Diane and I, we, we tend to like to find shows that we can binge watch on whatever channel it is and we started binge watching a new series and in this series one of the leads is struggling with 
what he perceives as his sin, his perceived he's his guilt. And in the most recent episode, and he goes to church. He's he goes to the church and he prays three or four times a week in a pew. He just sits there alone in the presence of God and he prays. In this most recent episode we watched, he invited a friend to go with him and he asked her, would you pray with me? And in through this prayer and through opening up to his friends and allowing others in and sharing his faith, this is pretty cool because it's network TV, they're talking about God. He's committing himself to God and he's starting to trust in God. And he had been keeping this book of his sins, kind of like the luggage that we like to talk about leaving at the foot of the cross. He was carrying this book, and in it he had a list. And it was a list that he was trying to atone for. On the way out, after praying with his friend, he was leaving his work, and he took his book out of his locker, and he threw it in the garbage. He's deciding to trust God, and God will bring it to pass. He will bring <coughs> forth righteousness. He will bring us into the light. And he will let us see justice. Verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And as I read this when Mark sent this to me earlier in the week, a song popped into my, my head from a church choir many years ago, Order My Steps. And I see not Mark Godden because he remembers that song. Different church. We weren't even we didn't even know each other at the time, but it's a it's a great song about God ordering our steps. But the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If we allow God in and the Holy Spirit to work through us, our steps are ordered by God, and He delights in that way. And even when we get tossed down. And sometimes we get bruised and banged up and muddy and dirty and filthy. And as we, as we saw Wednesday night, when Jesus reached out his hand to Peter, as Peter was walking in the water, came and he raised him out of the water. He upholds us with his hand. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to hear this message about submitting and committing, Father, we ask that we would hear the words that you have for us today. This lesson that you have given to Pastor Mark to bring to us this morning. We look forward to being able to use this message, these words, these teachings in our lives as we go out. Father, we thank you for each and every person that will hear it today, whether it's in person, whether it's online, or whether they will watch it someday in the future. That's the beauty of the internet. We can come back to it. Father, we just thank you that when we commit ourselves to your ways, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, that you will uphold us with your righteous hand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Show me that one, didn't you? Good morning, church. How's everyone today? Good morning. Look at that. The snow almost stopped. Uh, dwindling down, so we're, we're getting close. We're getting close. Yeah, barely there. Barely there. But the sun popped out, so that's a great thing. Uh, and it's amazing to see what a transformation that happens between when I came here this morning, the snow was just pouring down. It was coming down like crazy. I hadn't plowed the roads or anything yet. And so they were just getting out. I passed a, a snowplow coming back on uh, Highway 100 as I was coming across there this morning. And, uh, you know, people were struggling trying to get around. And then a few hours later, Iowa weather, wait, it'll change. Mm -hmm. The sun pops out, snow's starting to dwindle down. And so we get another start to the day. 
So I kind of wanted to talk about this. We're winding down season three of The Chosen, as Terry said. And this episode deals with our relationship with Christ Jesus. When we take a look at this and we look at these last few episodes and in my messages over the last three weeks, I've talked about our perspective, how our perspective, uh, what we perceive, we believe, our belief then uh, forms our actions and our actions then define our character. And then the next week I talked about our beliefs and our belief system and what our faith is and the differences between belief and faith and how we need to be sure that we understand that, uh, you know, we can believe that the sun's going to come out and the snow's going to go away and it may or may not do that. But see, faith is no matter what happens outside, God's got us and he's pulling us through us. And he never leaves us. He never forgets us. He never abandons us. And so today, I want to talk about submitting and committing yourself to God. And so our relationship with Jesus comes down to submitting our will to the will of God. Because when we submit our will to the will of God, we are following the example that Christ Jesus set for us. It also speaks to committing ourselves to Jesus and his teachings as well, to following the ways that Jesus taught the disciples as he was bringing them up and changing them out of their worldview, what they've grown to know the entire time that they've been growing up and all of the things there. And it's, and it's not an immediate change when he says, hey, come and follow me. You know, it's not like the light switch gets flipped on and your past goes away, but it's a gradual change as we come to know Christ and we come to know his will and the will of God, then we are changed from the inside out. And that's a gradual change. And see, when we, when we do that, we find out that, you know, it's not always such an easy process to go through. And they gave up so much in the process. They gave up so much of their lives. I mean, for the disciples, when, they, when he called them, you know, it was... Drop your livelihood, drop everybody that you know, and follow me. And it was quite the change, and it wasn't always an easy path. But what they gained in the process of all that was much greater than what they lost. What they gained was much greater than what they lost. So we see throughout this series of The Chosen where Jesus stops. If you ever notice that, every time, Jesus stops and he prays right before he does something great. And see, what he's doing then is when he does that, is he is submitting his will to God. <coughs> and in the process then, God enables him to do what needs to be done. And that's exactly what we are called to do in our lives each and every day. We need to submit ourselves to the will of God so that God can do great things through us as well. So, Jesus, as we see in his example that we are to follow as disciples of Christ, is he is committing to doing the will of God and following the will of God and submitting his will to the Father in heaven above all other things. Above all other things. And in the process then, what does God do? God enables him to do great things, great signs and wonders is what they called him in the day. He was able to do those miracles. Now today you're probably thinking, well, nobody around here does miracles, but you'd be surprised to see how many miracles are actually being done each and every day. But it all starts with submitting to the will of God. And most of us, including myself, this is going to be a tall order because it goes against the exact way that we were raised. And I remember this ad from the Army from a few years back that came out and said, be all that you can be. Now, you know, uh, it was a way for the Army to say to structure your life, to reach your full potential that you have inside and from a worldview, see, that makes sense because you have to rebuild yourself from the inside out, which is exactly what Christ will do when you submit your will to his. See, but in order to reach your full potential with the Army, you had to submit your will to theirs. And trust me, they will... Hard hit you to get that, sent, that done. 
But from a worldview perspective, then that makes sense. And then, you know, as I was growing up, we heard it on the radio as well. So we had all these different outside influences coming. There was a very popular song of the times back then from Fleetwood Mac, and it says, go your own way. Go your own way, which was one person's cry out for a relationship when the other person just wanted to be themselves. They didn't want to be tied down. They didn't want to be in that relationship. And it was a force of wills, people's wills going against each other. That's what that whole song was about. They wanted to be self-centered. In other words, the world revolved around themselves. The center of their world revolved around themselves. It was their own being. So from a world point of view then, that's fitting in very well because we're trained to be our own person, to be independent. Lori and I talk about this all the time, our youngest son. We, we taught him to be independent and to, you know, be responsible for himself, be responsible for his own life. Well, we kind of maybe went overboard a little bit. <laughs> he moves out to Los Angeles and, you know, we get to see him once every couple of years. Far too independent, <clears throat> especially from mom's point of view. But we're trained to be our own person. We're trained to be independent and self-reliant. And to be fair, that is not a horrible thing. But it does lead to what I term a oneness of self, a oneness of spirit. And sometimes if that goes unchecked, then it'll turn into pridefulness and everything that goes along with that. And then you have a far greater uh, self-worth than what you actually are in the world. And see, the thing about it is, when you get into that oneness spirit, a oneness of spirit, meaning you don't need anybody else, you've got yourself. Well, see, that can be a very lonely place to be. So as I'm going back through this and I'm writing the, the sermon, I think of Three Dog Night. So they wrote this song. One is the loneliest number. So I'm yeah. sure some of you have heard the song. I can't tell you how many times I've sang that song. But that's what it was all about, is they were talking about, hey, you can't go it alone in life. You need other people. And they said, as a matter of fact, two can be as bad as one because one is the loneliest number that you've ever known. And so, not ever knew is the actual verb. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about that, they, they were absolutely right in that song. Absolutely right. If you try and go it alone, in this world, or even maybe take one person along with you, it's not enough. You need that community. You need to be a person of community. As I said last week, God created us to be in communion with each other. We are all parts of the body of Christ. And if you read in, in Corinthians in there, it tells you all about it. Uh, but see, being a oneness of self, being one, being lonely, being out there by ourselves is the exact opposite of what God created us to be. We were created to be communal beings. That means we were meant to be in communion with one another, joined together to help build each other up and bring us through the storms that we are going to face in life. And as Christians, that becomes very, very important for us to understand and to be a part of that community of believers. That's why we always try to get people to come in here to church so we can share in the things that we're all going through. See, we have to have that surrendering of ourselves to others in the process in order for someone else to help you out. You can't internalize everything and hold it in. If you're going through something really bad, you need to share that. So we can help lift you up and out of that situation. We were built to be a familial unit, meaning a family of believers, with a surrendering of our spirit, spirit and our will to God. That's how God created us. And that's what we should really be focusing on. Focusing on having God at the center of our lives and then joined with our family of believers. So... What do we need to do? Well, we need to submit our will to the will of God, just like Jesus was doing. He would submit himself to the will of God, and then God would enable him to do great things. See, that takes us to the next point. 
We have to be submissive. We have to be submissive. And to be submissive means we need to arrange ourselves under the command of a divine viewpoint rather than living to one's old ways. So when we are born again of the Spirit, it means that we are devoiding ourselves of that oneness and we are joining together in the Spirit of God. And that old one way of life is based on a human viewpoint, not on a divine viewpoint. So we need to change our perspective to that divine viewpoint. Some, some people call that a Christian worldview. But truly, it's a divine viewpoint based upon the will of God. So we need to surrender our will to that of our fathers. Most of us, most of us, that will be a lifelong journey, a lifelong journey. And it's a process. It's not something that, you know, you can, as I said before, you can't just flip the switch and it's done. For us, it's going to be a process. As we learn and as we grow, then we can teach and we can go to do God's work. It is how we become the hands and feet of God. And it's a process. Okay. To submit to God is to align ourselves under his authority, not ours. By nature, we oppose authority. We do not like being told what to do. Am I right? Am I right? Don't like being told what to do? I rebelled against that as a kid. That was me. <laughs> but obedience to God should never be done grudgingly. We should admit, submit with a joyful a happy abandonment, if you will, to God's will, and as it's revealed to us in his word. The Apostle Peter writes this, Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's 1 Peter 5.5. 5. So the theme here is one of humility. A person cannot submit to God without being humbled first. Without that humility, we are coming against God and his authority. But when we humble ourselves to the authority of God, then God will oppose that person who comes against him, but he will give grace to the person who humbles himself before him. Obedience requires us to humble ourselves and to surrender to the authority of another. And we are told that God resists pride. The opposite of humility is pride. And the arrogance that fosters that pride is what makes us come against God. Arrogance causes that pride, fosters that pride. Therefore, having a humble and submissive heart is a choice we make. Now, if you guys follow me at all on Facebook, as I was coming back through and reviewing this, this song popped in my head. As a matter of fact, it was Thanksgiving morning. And it was a song by a group called Petra. It's called Thankful Heart. And if you've never heard the song, I invite you to go up there on YouTube and just type in Petra and then Thankful Heart. But it's, it's a person submitting as well. And, and it was written by John Schlitt. Uh, John Schlitt was the head singer or lead singer of Head East. So if you notice them the way back then, they were a pretty heavy-duty, hard rock and band at the time. He gave himself and his life over to Christ. And that song talks about having a thankful heart that you have given me. And it all comes from you. He submitted his will to God. God changed his life completely. He is no longer that person that was out on there doing drugs and leading people away from God. Instead, he turned his life around completely, submitted to God, and he was bringing people to God in the process through that gift and that talent that God gave him with music. So it's awesome when we see these things happen. And that, friends, is a miracle. So, therefore, having that humble and submissive heart is a choice that we have to make. Nobody can make it for us. We have to make our own choices for what we do with our lives. So we have to have a humble and submissive heart. That means 
being born again believers, as born again believers, we daily make a choice to submit ourselves to God for the work that the Holy Spirit does in us in order to conform to that image of Christ that I was talking about before. And see, that's if, if we watch The Chosen, that's exactly what the disciples slash apostles before they were sent, that's exactly what the disciples had to do on a daily basis. And they show it in the, in the film. They had to change, they had to make that daily choice to submit themselves to the will of God and let that Holy Spirit conform us to that image of Christ. God will use the situations of our life to bring us into an opportunity to submit to him. Ever think about the challenges that we face in life, the trials, all of the things, all the bad stuff that happens in our lives? Do you understand that's an opportunity for us to go to God and submit ourselves to his will? Never thought about it that way, probably. That is the opportunity for doing, and that is exactly what is happening. If you look at Paul over and over again as he's writing this, he uses those situations to bring those opportunities for God to have him submit his will to God and to show that out in all the great works that Paul did. Romans 8, 5, or 8, 25 through 30 says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. Eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That is called the still, small voice of God, speaking through the Holy Spirit to talk to us, to urge us on towards doing God's will in our life. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, if you listen to that still small voice and you put it into action, then he will intercede for us according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, the believer then accepts his grace and provision to walk in the Spirit, not after the manner of the old nature. Now, some of these things kind of lose translation for us in the process. But truly, this speaks very well of submitting ourselves and committing ourselves to God. And if we do and when we do, then he will call us according to his purpose. That is the will of God. Because before he knew us, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Before we were born, he already had it as part of the plan for your life and my life to be conformed to the image of his son, Christ Jesus. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You kind of have to translate some of these old sayings the way they speak. But this is also talking about submitting ourselves and committing to God. And when we do, then the Holy Spirit will work in us and through us to do the will of God. That work is accomplished by choosing to apply ourselves to the Word of God and to learning about the provisions that God has made for us in Christ Jesus. See, we have to do our part. A lot of people just come up and give God this wish list when we pray to him. And I call it a Christmas list. God, I want this, and I want this, and I want this in my life. But the problem with that is, is when did we submit ourselves to God to begin with? So we have to come to God and say, thank you for all the blessings you give me in my life. We have to thank him for all the provisions that he made for our life. Those that we didn't even ask for. So we have to come before us with a grateful heart. We have to come before him with humility. We have to submit ourselves to him first. And then, once we have a humble heart or an earnest heart, as the scripture tells us, 
When we come before him with an earnest heart by prayer and petition, he will answer those prayers. He has given that as assurance in his word. See, but we have to do our part first. We have to do our part first. See, and that's called committing ourselves to the life of Christ. From the moment that we are born again, we have all the provisions that we need in Christ to become a mature believer. But we have to commit to the choice to learn about those provisions through study of the word in communion with the body of Christ, the church, and to apply those provisions to our daily walk. That's exactly what God is talking to us about, being in that familial relationship, the body of Christ. We have to commit to learn about the provisions that God makes for us in our life through study of the word in communion with the body of Christ. It doesn't mean you go your own way and you do it by yourself. One is the loneliest number. What it means is we join together to lift each other up. And if you ever notice as we're having discussions in here, we have one person that has a different perspective than another person in the group. And together those things build us and help us learn and build ourselves up in the body of Christ at the same time. That's called edification. So did you notice what I said here about committing ourselves to being in a relationship with Christ? This is what it means to be in Christ. If we are not in Christ with him at the center of our lives, then we have not fully committed ourselves to him. You cannot have a relationship with someone you only casually know. You cannot have a relationship with someone you only casually know. See, that's called an acquaintance. You're acquainted with that person, but you're not in a relationship. You don't know that person intimately. And intimately, I'm not talking on a sexual basis here. I'm talking intimately, meaning you know the troubles that they have in their life. You know the gains that they have in their life, the, the happiness that they have in their life. You know something about that person. You're not simply acquainted with that person. That's called having a relationship with that person. Meaning the basis of that word is related. You're related. See, we're related as the body of Christ, the family of the church. So as Craig Glitman tells us, as a Christian, we cannot know God unless we first know Jesus. And see, that is very true. You see, Jesus is the visual image of the unseen God. I think that is an awesome, awesome example. Awesome example. That Jesus is the image of an unseen God. And Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, 5, B through 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So to love Jesus is to love God. But how can we love someone if we don't know them? That's what this whole, whole verse and this whole passage is based on. How can we love someone if we don't know them. Kind of hard to do, isn't it? So Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. What he's saying is, you have to know me, Jesus, as the Son of God in order to know my Father. And in order to love me or to love God, you have to know me. Not a casual acquaintance. You don't typically love a casual acquaintance. You know someone and you love someone when you are in a relationship to them and with them, or as I said before, in them when we are in Christ. So how can you love someone if you don't know? Well, the short answer is we can. If we come to know Jesus through the body of Christ, us here as the church, which I mentioned in all of us last week, is all of us gathered together in communion with each other. 
I keep saying that word over and over again, but it's very, very important for you to understand. We learn that through teaching and through preaching, from coming here on Wednesday evenings. We have some great discussions that go on, but it's a chance for us to learn to grow. See, if you look at how the disciples were formed and turned into the apostles, it was an immediate transformation, as I've said. So we have to come together, we have to gather together to learn or to know, to grow then in Christ, and then to go out and fulfill the commission that he gave us, which was to go into all the world, make disciples of all people. All peoples, not just some. And see, we can know and love God through having a right relationship with him. That's called righteousness. That's a meaning a right relationship is what that means. Any relationship needs commitment, and it takes work to grow, whether it's a friendship or a marriage, or really anything worthwhile takes commitment to make it work. And to make it work well. Otherwise, you're simply just going through the motions. The last thing you want to hear at the end of your life is, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you serve while back on earth. I heard those words uh, in a line that came from a song sung by the Good News Quartet. And this is going to date me. So that was back in 1968. Okay? But see, even from 1968, I still remember those songs those words to that song. It was ingrained in my mind. I'm going, wow, I don't want to get to the end of my life and hear, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you served well back on earth. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, which is what I want to hear from God when I get to heaven. And the only way I can do that is to be in a relationship with him. We won't hear it any other way. We won't see it any other way. See, back in 1968, it was a real wake-up call for me. It had a real profound impact on me. I just went through some major trauma in my life, or so it seemed at the time. I just moved across town, and I started a new school mid-year. That's a tough thing to do. I knew absolutely no one in the school, and there was no love loss between the two schools that we had. That made it even worse because nobody wanted to be associated with a kid from that school across town. And so for a seventh grader, it was a tough thing to go through. All my friends were gone. There were no cell phones, no Facebook, no Instagram, no easy way to reach out and touch someone. All of those friends got left behind. But I had friends at my church and I had friends through Scouts and that community got me through what I was struggling with. But see, that still stuck with me through all these years. And I hope it speaks to your heart today, too. The pastor at our church uh, at the time heard me reading scriptures in Sunday school one day. And he came up to me and he says, I have a, you have a calling to be a pastor in church. And I looked at him and thought, <laughs> I don't want to be a minister. You have to be perfect. I can't do that. I remember saying that. Well, 55 years later, here I am. Still not perfect. And I didn't get here without some kicking and screaming along the way. But see, despite all my wavering, I kept getting this nudging, this urge, that still small voice kept talking to me over and over and over again. Then it became more of an urging then it came as a smack upside the head. <laughs> when God wants your attention, he's going to get it. Believe me. Uh, he will get it. So I was doing lots of things in my life. But see, I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. I hadn't submitted my will to the will of God's. But he still had that plan for me. 55 years later, he's going, you need to work the plan I have for you in your life. you got to commit and you have to submit. And he got my attention. <laughs> Took a heart attack. No. <laughs> no. Uh, 
But see, I was doing lots of things in my life. And I thought I was leading a really, really good life. And I was doing all these things, but I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. See, in God's eyes, he doesn't need us. He wants us to follow the path that he has chosen for us. He doesn't need us to do it. He wants us to do it because he wants the best for our lives. The best for our lives. He wants a committed relationship. And we won't hear when it comes to the end of our age. We won't hear, hey, sorry. Sorry. I never knew you. Sorry. See ya. I wouldn't want to be ya, if you want to put it in today's vernaculars. See ya. I wouldn't want to be ya. You don't want to get up to that point in your life, at the very end of your life. Because, see, there's no do-overs. There's no timeouts. There's no going back and fixing it at that point in time. It's too late. It was kind of a, I hope you'll like heat message at the end of your journey. I don't think anybody has, well, not today, maybe we'd like a little more heat. Who knows? But not that much. Not forever. So it takes commitment to follow, to submit, to learn, to grow in the community of God. In this episode of The Chosen, we see the continuation of character development with Simon Peter and the loss of his baby. And he is so furious. His commitment to follow Jesus then becomes in question. His anger that Jesus didn't prevent it from happening was making him blind to the bigger picture. In the reality of the world, the reality of life, even as a believer, he has to go through the trials and troubles and tribulations so that he can depend on God more fully. See, he was still kind of the Simon character of the time. He wasn't in communion with God. So in the show, we hear John tell Simon that Jesus told him there would be times of trials and troubles, but he would see him through it. But see, Simon Peter, he was, he was so blinded to that because of the anger, to the rage, that Jesus didn't step in and keep him from losing that child, that it blinded him to that bigger picture. He couldn't see how Jesus would see him through it. But see, the whole point was he needed to have faith in the midst of that storm of life, in the midst of those trials and troubles, he needed to have faith and belief that there were bigger and better things on the horizon. But see, that's hard to see when you're blinded by rage. We see Jesus tell John how he needed Simon to be there because he was going to be the key to the success, success in the mission that they were undertaking at that point in time. And see, that didn't sit well with John. Kind of reminded me of the, the story of the prodigal son where the, the one son tells his dad that he wants all his money up front. He wants his inheritance now while his dad is still living. Now in the Jewish community and in, in that type of situation, he's saying, Father, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. Give me my money. And he went out and squandered all his money. But his brother stayed. And he helped his father. And he worked with his father the whole time. And then when the prodigal son comes home, turns home, the father lavishes him and welcomes him back. But see, that didn't sit well with his brother who was there the whole time. And we see that same thing with John and Simon in this relationship. We see Jesus tell John how he needed Simon there because he was going to be the key to the success of their mission. And that didn't sit well with John. Because Simon, see, he'd been going out on his own feet kind of left those guys hanging. So as you can see, even the disciples and the apostles struggled with their emotions, strife, hurt, and loss. They were just like us. They were a work in progress. They were a work in progress. We see Jesus ministering to the lost and performing yet another miracle for those who needed it and needed to see in order to believe. And in the process, 
Hearts and lives were changed, not just by the people who had the miracles performed for them, but all those who could see that miracle performed. It changed hearts and lives. The last scene in the season is one of very, very great importance. It shows the disciples slash apostles in a boat in the Sea of Galilee, and they're in the midst of a storm, and they're frightened by what could happen to them in the boat. And then Jesus walks out to them on the water. See, he's testing their beliefs. He's testing their faith. He's testing the trust that they put in him. And everything was good until it wasn't. And Peter goes down underneath the water. So let's read that in the passage. Matthew 14, 22 through 32. And that takes us from Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. He was submitting his will to God. He was asking God to enable him. When the evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way away from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. They were in the midst of a mighty storm. And in the fourth night of the watch, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Where's their faith? Where's their beliefs? But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And with that, they got in the boat, and the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Son of God. And depending upon what translation you read in here, one of the translations say that Jesus spoke to the storm. I believe it's Mark. Uh, Jesus spoke to the storm and he said, Peace, be still. And the wind calmed down. The waves subsided. The storm was over. The storm was over. Simon Peter was okay as long as he was focused on Jesus. He could walk out on the water just like Jesus as long as he kept himself focused on Jesus. See, but then he looked at his circumstance. He looked at the wind and the waves, and he panicked and would have drowned had it not been for Jesus reaching out to save him. In the natural, it would be making very much sense to be fearful because he grew up on a boat. He knew what the storms were like on the Sea of Galilee. He made his living on that sea. And if a storm come up, it sank many boats. And they killed many a person that were in there, the fishermen that were working the boats. So in the natural, in the natural, it would be making sense to be fearful in the midst of that storm. But see what he lost sight of. He lost sight of that he believes in a supernatural God that can overcome the storms of life. And the natural would be fearful. But see, we serve a supernatural God, and there's no problem big enough that he can't handle. We have to understand that there is a purpose for the problems. God has a purpose for everything, even when we can't see it. In the midst of the storms of life, we need to see that they're actually building our faith, strengthening our belief, and when we are at our most vulnerable, that is the time that we need to rely on Jesus and in his word to keep our eyes on 
him keep us focused on him so we don't lose our faith so we don't lose our belief in the process paul writes in second corinthians 12 9 through 11 but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness in weakness therefore i will boast of all of the more gladly about my weaknesses so that christ's power may rest on me may rest on me that is why for christ's sake i delight in weaknesses in insults in hardships in persecutions in difficulty for when i am weak then i am strong strong in christ and in the 23rd psalm it tells us it states this for encouragement even though i walk through the darkest valley i will not be afraid for you are close beside me your rod and staff will protect and comfort me see and i think you know I, i've read this i can't tell you how many times in funerals for people and if you go to the King James Version, it's, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. But see, they miss the entire point. They're going through the darkest point in their lives, the valley of the shadow of death. But it doesn't say, I'm leaving you there. I'm abandoning you there. That's not what it says. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of life, thou art with me. Even through the darkest point of my life, you are there bringing me through it. It doesn't mean we won't go through the valley. It means that he is work, walking right alongside us through that valley. And he will protect us. And he will comfort us in the midst of that storm. In the midst of the darkest part of our lives. But see, we've got to have faith. We have to believe. We have to keep focused on him in the midst of the storm. We see here assurances that God gives us in his word that the circumstance that we are in, the trial that we are facing, is not permanent. It's just temporary. That goes right back to what I said last week about our belief system. Our beliefs plus our faith equal our actions. If we've got good beliefs, we have good faith, we will have good actions. And ultimately, that determines then our future. In the midst of it all, he's there to guide us, to comfort us, to protect us, and to strengthen us. But see, we wouldn't know any of this if we weren't in communion with God, in a relationship with God, with his word, with his church, with the body of Christ, in the body of Christ. All of this would be unknown. That's why it's so important for us to submit ourselves to the teaching and to the preaching, to the growth and learning, and in being in a right relationship with the living God in Christ Jesus. So I have some questions for you today. Do you know someone who has not heard the word of God, who needs to hear this message today? Have you told them? Have you invited them to church? Are you being the hands and feet of God? What is Jesus calling you to do today? Will you answer the call? See, in all areas of our life, at all times, God is present always and forever. Let us pray. Dear God, as we enter into this season of Thanksgiving and Advent, Help us to always look for the many things for which we can be grateful, even in the midst of the times of loss, of trials and troubles. And in the midst of the storms of life that seem to overwhelm us, help us stay focused on you. Let us enjoy the peace that comes with having a grateful heart, that you are guiding our path and ordering our steps. Your word tells us that it will rain on the just and the unjust alike. But in the midst of the rain, there's always something to be thankful for. Renewal. Renewal. God, remind us that you are always there. And always, always, all we need to do is call out to you. At our time of need. And you will answer that call. 
Lord God, help me to remember that in my life is a gift and that my health is a blessing, that every new day is filled with an awesome potential. Remind me each day that I have that capacity to bring something whole and new and unique into this and good into this broken world. Each day, help me, God, to remember to be kind and patient to the people who love me and to those who work with me as well. Open my eyes to see all of the beauty of your creation that I have so often ignored. And to listen to that silent urging in my soul, your still small voice calling to me. Lord Jesus, embolden me to respond to your calling. Just for today, God, help me to remember you. <clears throat> Let this be a good day, God, full of joy and love and gratitude. This meal represents what Christ did for us on the cross. As I was listening to the message and I was thinking about it, as Mark was talking about how just mad Peter was, I wonder what his perspective would, will be in the chosen when we get to this point where we do witness this meal. And Peter thinks back to and this will be beyond the meal. This is be after Jesus' death and resurrection. But for Peter to see how called Jesus was in the midst of all the disciples, in the midst of Judas who would betray him, Jesus was called. In fact, he serves them. He washes their feet. It was on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And he gave it to the disciples. Towards the end of the meal, he took the cup. And after filling it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us that as often as we do this, we are to do so until Jesus' return. It can be very difficult when we think of all the things in our lives that are just up in sheer upheaval. This week I watched a video of that I never knew about. I never knew, I always knew that little Richard was um, gay. I always knew that. What I didn't know and this is after his father's death because his father kicked him out at 17 said get out you're not part of this family and he kicked him out his father would die before little Richard would come to know Jesus and Jesus would go out and or little Richard would actually go out doing what Christ commanded to go out into the whole, the whole world and he would become an evangelist giving up that lifestyle. Never, ever stop praying for those that you love. Never, ever stop praying for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because this meal was done not just for us as believers, but for all, whether they will ever believe in Jesus or not. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father, we thank you that 
there are people out there that continually pray for those who don't know you yet. As we do. As we should. And as Mark said in his sermon part, we need to continue to invite and pray for these people, getting them into a body of believers where they can come into that right relationship with you, Father. <coughs> Father, we thank you for what your son did on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Denise, I know you're watching, and yes, we miss you, but thank you for sending your prayer. Is there anyone that has any prayers that they would like to share or maybe an update? I already have some from Denny. Jennifer, I did see your request in the comments, so we've got you on here as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning to thank you for giving us life and breath. That we are able to celebrate you during this holiday season, this Advent season leading up to Christmas. We are so thankful that you died on a cross to save us from our sins. We are so thankful the blessing that you pour out upon us each and every single day. We are thankful that you created animals of all kinds that we may love and take care of them. That when they love us back, it's unconditionally. Therefore, this morning we ask that you be with Bowen as he has said goodbye to his dog Zeus. May Zeus be pres blessed with you, your presence as he has come to see you recently. We ask that since he showed so much love to the Bowen family and friends that when he was alive that you would ask an angel to take care of him in heaven. We thank you that you created Zeus for the Bowen family. We thank you that you've given us an opportunity to pray for others, Father. We lift up Denny's friend, Jennifer's mother, who went through surgery recently on her leg and is now resting. We pray for his friend, Allie, who is driving to Northern Michigan, a 10 hour drive, and I know Mark's used to those drives. And I know most of us think, you know, a couple hour drive, not a big deal, but Father, 10 hours is a long time for a young woman to be driving by herself, so we pray for safe travel. We pray for Jennifer Franks and her family for the unsaid prayer that request that has been given. We thank you that the overflow shelter is open, but Father, we would pray for more beds in, in, in more places as this winter has already started off with several inches of snow. Father, we pray for those who are struggling right now with, with life in general, whether it's because of an illness or finances or just simply because they're nearing end of life and they want to give up. This time of year, Father, is such a difficult time around the Christmas holiday season. Is That is what happens. Father, I also lift up my cousin Ellen, who has been fighting cancer for some 20 odd years now, who now recently found out she has stage three kidney disease. Pray for my aunt Maxine, who will be having knee surgery soon. May it go well for her as she is, even in her 80s, is very much active and out and about still playing in church. Father, we thank you that not only has the sun come out outside, but the sun is present. Your sun is present with us here this morning. Father, we just thank you for the many blessings in our lives. We pray this all in your son Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Well, this brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today. And uh, we thank you for joining us today. We had uh, uh, quite a few people online today, and, and that is greatly appreciated. We'd love to have you come and join us for some of the activities that we mentioned in our announcements. So I enjoy, uh, invite you to go back and review those as well. Um, <clears throat> we have a song I posted up this morning that, I, that was really speaking to me. Uh, it's a song that's Rhett Walker's latest song. It's called The Man on the Middle Cross. And uh, it spoke to me uh, greatly this morning <laughs> as I was coming in uh, today. So I uh, posted it up for you. There's a YouTube link for it. And um, please enjoy that song. And, and uh, hopefully it speaks to you as well. So let's go to God in prayer as we close out this time of worship for online. Gracious Lord God, we, we come before you today and we confess that we are sinners and we are in need of your grace and your mercy, Lord. We repent of our sins today and we, we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that we could be redeemed and made whole again with you, brought into a right relationship with you today. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit gives us the strength to get through the storms of life, that you send us hope, that you send us love, that you send us guidance to be your disciples in this lost world. Lord, we lift our lives up to you today. We lift up our church, our city, our state, and our nation to you. Lord, we live in a holy, broken world. And we ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in that world. That your word and that your name would be proclaimed boldly. And that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out. To bring home the loss and to lead us to growth in your spirit. And keep us unto you in all things. In your precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said,